what a, what a week it has been so far. Tuesday night, the first keynote, Rick actually steps up to the plate and promptly blasts a home run over the fence. And then last night, the second keynote, Don McLaughlin steps up and, and may, may have hit the ball out of the planet, I'm not sure. <laughs> and then this morning, I've had the pleasure of sitting here and listening to Colin and then to Brian step up with a third home run and a fourth home run. I'm not sure if there are baseball fans in the audience, but do you know the Major League Baseball record for consecutive home runs by a team? So I get, the, I, get the, I get the fifth keynote here. It's okay. It's okay. Um, multiple teams have done it. Last year was the last time the Washington Nationals hit four home runs in a row, and then Daniel Murphy steps to the plate and flies out to center field. But I want you to know that last year, then Anthony Rendon steps up and hits a fifth home run in the evening. So come back tonight when Josh is speaking. <laughs> there is a good chance. Uh, my church has heard me tell this story before, but 20 years ago, uh, when I was a brand new full-time preacher, uh, I went to a preaching seminar and Rick Ashley was there. Uh, and Rick was saying, he says, don't try to be a home run preacher. He said, just be a preacher that, that works with a family and you just try to get on base week after week after week. And, and, and that's the advice I've tried to follow um, when I preached in Mississippi and now that I'm preaching again here in California is just to get on base it makes it hard to think about a keynote, though. It's a little different uh, sort of feeling. But today, I'm just going to crowd the plate, Mike, and hope I get hit by a pitch. And, uh, and we'll uh, keep this train going. Let's let this prayer. I have a home run text. Let's let this prayer continue to wash over us today. I bow my knees before the Father from whom every family in heaven and on earth takes its name. I pray that according to the riches of his glory, he may grant that you may be strengthened in your inner being with power through his spirit. And that Christ may dwell in your hearts through faith as you are being rooted and grounded in love. I pray that you may have the power to comprehend with all the saints what is the breadth and length and height and depth and to know the love of Christ that surpasses knowledge so that you may be filled with all the fullness of God. Now to him who by the power at work within us is able to accomplish abundantly far more than all we can ask or imagine, to him be glory in the church and in Christ Jesus to all generations forever and ever. Amen. Amen. Last fall, my youngest daughter studied abroad in Spain. And she flew back to see us uh, three days before Christmas. It was December the 22nd, uh, and I had the good fortune of being the one to go to the airport to pick her up after she had been gone for a semester. And so I stood there and saw her in the hugs and, and all the luggage, including all the things that she bought while she was studying abroad. We gathered into the car. Uh, it was at night, and we were driving home. Uh, we skipped the obligatory in and out run. She prefers the Chick-fil-A on Lincoln Boulevard. So like our tradition, we went through the drive through ended up on the Pacific Coast Highway, we're, was driving up the highway toward Malibu three days before Christmas, when what to our wondering eyes would appear, but something. We, we weren't sure what it was, but we were driving up the road. And if you've been here any time at all, you realize that planes fly over and you see the planes coming toward LAX, and there was something going across the sky three days before Christmas, and it, it was hurtling across the sky, and, and I thought it must be a plane. What else could be up there at this time, except it looked sort of like it was on fire, but not just on fire. It was like it was spurting fiery things all, all around it, and it was, it was just coming across the night sky, and there is no one in this world more skeptical than my daughter, and she started proclaiming her belief in aliens at this point. <laughs> and our minds went everywhere. It started to race to, uh, you know, could this be a plane that's going down? I mean, my daughter just flew across the world, and my mind is going to some of those worst-case scenarios. 
North Korea was in the news. We started to talk about that. You know, what could this be? And then at one point, it looked like it exploded. I remembered in high school when the Space Shuttle Challenger exploded, that picture of how, and, and, and something happened and it, and it started to separate and, and something started catapulting over the ocean one way and the other thing was catapulting the other way. And my daughter's a lot smarter than I am, so she said, I'm going to get on Twitter and see what's happening. And so she gets on Twitter, and what she sees on Twitter is basically the conversation we're having. People are like, what is going on in the skies above Los Angeles? They use different words than that, but they were concerned about what was taking place here. Nobody seemed to know until finally she said, oh, oh, here it is. Elon Musk and the SpaceX program, they launched a rocket from Vandenberg, and that's what's happening. I don't know if you remember it from the news, but that night it was on World News Tonight. All of the local stations were being inundated with phone calls. Everyone forgot to mention that there was going to be a nighttime rocket launch across our, uh, across our skies here. It didn't dawn on me till later. The most amazing thing about that entire story was that when we found out that it was a rocket launch, we said, oh, it's just a rocket launch. I mean, I, I, hang with me here for just a second, right? We live in a world where we find out that somebody, some billionaire, builds something and sends it rocketing into the depths of outer space, and we're like, oh, that's all that is. Where is our imagination? Oh, I know where it is because a few days ago on the news it said that someone's building a space hotel. And the next phase of all of this is people are going to start vacationing in outer space. By the year, it was like 2022 or something. It's going to be the first time. They already have reservations that they're taking. We're, we're, we're way past rocket launches. And I want to ask you this morning, how are things at your church? Is it a place and a time where you get together with wonder and, and, and imagination and excitement of what's going to happen, of what God's doing? Or does it feel a little bit like, oh, it's, it's another rocket launch? As proof of the Holy Spirit this week, I promise I've been preparing this lesson for a long time. But this morning, as I'm in my office, I think I may bring the Apostles' Creed here today without knowing that Chad and his team were going to use that as a call to worship and a song for us today. But I thought when Brian Zahn handed this out the other day, do we really believe this? I believe in God, the Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth. I believe in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, conceived by the power of the Holy Spirit and born of the Virgin Mary. He suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended to the dead. On the third day, he rose again. He ascended into heaven and is seated at the right hand of the Father. He will come again to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and life everlasting. Amen. Do we believe that? Or do we hear those words and say those words and it's, it's just another rocket launch? One of the important organizations in my life, personally, has been Habitat for Humanity. Many years ago, um, I was really inspired by that organization, uh, and I helped start an affiliate in my hometown. I, I got a chance to do that later uh, in another place. And, and I was enamored by the story of how Habitat for Humanity came to be. Uh, Millard Fuller and his wife, Linda. Uh, Millard was a millionaire in the 1950s uh, in Alabama. His wife said that she was going to leave him uh, because he cared more about his money than her. Uh, it changed his priorities. They gave away all of their money. They moved into Koinonia Farm with uh, Clarence Jordan in southwest uh, Georgia. They began to think instead of how to make money, of how to, how to do things to help the kingdom of God, and they began building houses for people in southwestern Georgia. He went to Zaire uh, and tried this out and came back and founded the organization Habitat for Humanity. As he tells his story, his first affiliate was in San Antonio, Texas, and he started on this tour, and he was on a radio show somewhere. He doesn't even remember where. And they called in, and someone asked him a question that he hadn't even thought of. And they said, what is your goal with Habitat for Humanity? 
And it had just been a blur for him. He didn't know what his goal was, but somehow, immediately, his answer was to remove poverty housing from the face of the earth. And then he said, and when we finish with that, we'll figure out something else to do. <laughs> and he said that on that radio show, when he made that statement, the lines lit up. Everyone was calling in. Everyone was asking questions. And he surmised that if he would have said, we're trying to help a few people that are down on their luck. That it would have been just another rocket launch. But that when he shared this vision, suddenly people were interested. In his book, A Simple, Decent Place to Live, he has at the beginning a quote by an architect named Daniel Burnham that I've, I've thought about for 25 years now. And Daniel Burnham said, make no small plans. They have no magic to stir men's blood. Make big plans. Aim high in hope and work. Make no small plans. They have no magic to stir men's blood. Make big plans. Aim high in hope and work. This past semester, a man named John Perkins, some of you may know, uh, from uh, Mississippi came to speak to us. He's 87 years old now. He wrote his last book last year when he was 86 years old. He's hard to keep up with. He's, uh, he's, uh, he's a little slower, but he's just as active as he's ever been. He grew up as an African-American man in Mississippi at a time when, uh, uh, when Jim Crow was in full swing. His brother was killed. He was a victim of abuse. He dropped out of school when he was in third grade. And John Perkins now, a third grade dropout, has 13 honorary doctorates from universities across the country and has an academic center named after him. He is, a, 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 the, the, the popular band Switchfoot has uh, written a song uh, about him, the John Perkins Blues. He sat on the stage next to Ronald Reagan when he gave his evil empire speech. He said, I'm a third grade dropout that's a preacher who has just tried to live the message of reconciliation. He was beaten one night in, a, a, in a, the Brandon County Jail while his wife and other supporters stand, stood outside and heard him scream. And here he stands at 87 years old. And his last book is titled, Dream With Me. Dream With Me. He says, how does this happen? How, do, how does his life happen? And his answer in his book is, all I know to say is things like this happen when you follow after God. He said, I don't know, I can't explain it. And guess what he quotes? Ephesians chapter 3, verse 20. The God who does more than we could ever ask or imagine. Let me ask you a question, a little test here. Uh, in your imagination, I'm asking a real question here. In your imagination, what could God do with your church? Think about that for a second. I'm, I'm asking you for real, not hypothetically, but, but really, what could God do with your church family? If I was brave enough, I've had you share that to people next to you, but it could be a preacher and an elder sitting next to each other, and you, this may create a problem. Uh, we don't want to do that here today. But I want you to imagine, what could God do? What's your picture? If you had to write it down, and maybe you have a pen, or you use your phone or something, and you want to, if you had to write down today, what is the thing that God could do with our church. What would that be? And now let me ask you the question. <laughs> it's what I just asked, but I'm asking it a different way. Can God actually do that? Can God actually do that? Well, let me ask a follow-up question. Can, can God do more than that, than what you could imagine? <laughs> Some of you are with me. Can God do far more than that which you've imagined? Is it possible that God could do abundantly far more than even that which you could in your imagination picture here today? Because I don't want to lie to you. Let me just try it again to make sure it's right. Now to him who by the power at work within us is able to accomplish abundantly far more than all we can ask or imagine. To him be glory in the church forever and ever. And amen. I loved last night. I, I don't think it was the, the line that necessarily everyone wrote down, but toward the end of Don's message, he mentioned Thomas Campbell and the Declaration and Address. And when he mentioned that address, 
He didn't say it like, oh yeah, that, that happened. He said, I'm still moved by that amazing picture that we might be able to lay down all of our differences and come together in a unity movement that brings together the entire body of Christ, not separated or, or, uh, uh, or amputated as he talked about, but I am still moved by that. And I wonder when we hear about Thomas Campbell and when we hear about the, the, the seeds of the restoration movement, when we hear about the declaration and address, has that become just another rocket launch? We're needing to be wowed by something else. Or is it possible that there's still magic in that? Is it possible that there may be magic to stir our blood to imagine what God could do in this world? I don't want to just, uh, uh, just throw things out. Uh, uh, just, you know, maybe this would be something interesting. I want to use the text. And Mike gave me an option between Ephesians 1 and Ephesians 3. And I appreciated that and I chose Ephesians 3. But then I looked around and noticed no one else has Ephesians. So I'm taking the whole letter uh, today um, as my text. It's mine. And I found a little bit of help. There's something uh, uh, helpful online, uh, and it's, it's called N.T. Wright Anything, whatever you want to uh, learn something about. And so N.T. Wright Ephesians brought the book of Ephesians in 15 minutes. He has a lecture, and he goes through the entire uh, book of Ephesians, and he begins with uh, the verse, uh, verse 10 of the first chapter, verse 10 of the second, verse 10 of the third, to lay out Paul's theology here. And if you can imagine with me in Ephesians chapter 1, verse 10, Paul is reminding this church, I think it reminds us, church, that God is gathering all things together to himself in heaven and on earth. Everything that God is bringing together in unity, all things in heaven and on earth into one. You remember Jesus' prayer that, that, that he taught us to pray. Your kingdom come and your will be done on earth like it is in heaven. God is breaking down all of the barriers. I might even go so far as to say God has broken down all the barriers. We're just still living with them propped up. But God is breaking down all of these barriers and bringing all things together in himself. Now, it's great to say that in chapter 1 and think, well, go God. But chapter 2 reminds us that we're a part of this story that we're engaged in this, uh, this act of creation, of bringing together heaven on earth, heaven and earth. You remember, we remember the famous verses, it's by grace you are saved through faith, not by yourself, it's an act of God, not by works, so that no one can boast. Verse 10, for we are God's workmanship. Another way to say that is we are God's work of art. Right, it says we're God's poem. We're God's showpiece, for we are God's workmanship created in Christ Jesus to do good works. We have a role in this. We are part of this creation. We have things that we are doing together. As you read, continuing in verse uh, 16, it mentions that we're together as one body. Verse 18, there's one spirit. By the time you get to verse 21 and 22, it's saying that we are actually, all of us, coming together as one house. We are bricks in a house that God is building together so that he can live inside that house. Chapter 1, chapter 2. Chapter 2 leaves us feeling pretty good about things until we're reminded in chapter 3 that this isn't just fun and games that this isn't just easy, that the church, these people, this kingdom that God is, is using and creating is there to stand as a witness in the world against rulers and authorities. Chapter 3, verse 10. That this mystery of God, that the church stands as a witness to the rulers and the authorities in the heavenly places. You may um, uh, think of the words, the principalities and powers, or maybe you read Walter Wink and this domination system and, and the, the evil that keeps us all separated. God's doing something far more important than that. And our prayer ends this first half of Ephesians, these first three chapters where Paul lays out God's project, his movement in this world. And then it's Paul often does, we go to the second half and he gets practical. Therefore, as a result of all of this, Paul tells us in verse 4 to attempt to maintain the unity of the Spirit in the bond of peace. This unity movement, 
it, it's there. God did it. He created it. It's unity. We're to maintain this unity of the spirit in the bond of peace. For there's one body, one spirit, one Lord, one faith, one baptism, one God and Father of all who is over all, above all, and in all. And yet God has made us different, as Don reminded us last night. And he's made people in different parts and we have gifts in different ways. But we all come together and grow up into the head. And our only uh, um, memory here is not to grieve the Spirit, chapter 4, verse 30. And as we go into chapter 5, Paul invites us to actually, I know this is hard to say uh, in a church, but to, to step up to the bar and order a drink, but to order a drink of the Spirit. Turn on your televisions. What does the world offer us. What, is, what are the commercials? That's what the world is offering. That's the project of the world. As Christine Kane said yesterday, how can church be boring when we realize the alternative that's being offered here? That God is bringing all, of, all things together in himself. And in chapter 5, we said, don't get drunk on things like alcohol. What a waste of a life for that to be what you live for. Get drunk on the Spirit. Get sloppy drunk on the Spirit of God. Let it overwhelm you and take your life. It changes everything. He spends the rest of chapter 5 and into chapter 6 reordering all of the relationships, all of the structures that they were used to in their day and time. Wives and husbands, fathers and Patriarchs, children, masters, slaves, everything's getting turned up on its head because we're now being, uh, being, uh, being guided by Jesus. We are now filled with the Spirit. We are breaking down boundaries and bringing things together in one. And chapter 6 reminds us again that this is not easy, that there is a war that's going on, that our battle is not against flesh and blood, but against the, the spiritual Spirit, you will, forces of evil. And so put on the full armor of God, and there's all sorts of defensive things here of our shield and our, uh, and our, and our breastplates and our, our helmet. But there's one weapon that's on the offense and is saved to the last. And take with you the sword of the Spirit, which is the Word of God. And chapter 6, verse 18 says to pray in the Spirit as Paul's closing this together. For all things. And our prayer, you see, our text today is smack in the middle of this. From the end of this development of what God is doing, this amazing thing that God is doing in the world, to how we live into that, our prayer pivots the entire letter. And it's a Trinitarian prayer. Listen to this, verse 14 through 17. Listen to the Trinity as we, uh, as we read. I bow my knees before the Father from whom every family in heaven and on earth takes its name. I pray that according to the riches of his glory, he may grant that you may be strengthened in your inner being with power through his spirit and that Christ may dwell in your hearts through faith. I want you to notice the location of how this Trinitarian uh, event is taking place. It's happening in our inner being, as Don said last night, individually and communally. That God is strengthening us with power through his spirit in our inner being. And that through Christ, through Christ, we are uh, in fellowship with the love of Christ. And we are rooted and grounded in love. In this love, he goes on to say, verse 18, as Linda prayed for us earlier, that, that this love that's indescribable, this love that is, uh, we, we can't comprehend the height and the depth. I love this verse because one of my most popular answers to questions is, I don't know. And this says, how do you describe the love of God? You can't know because it's beyond knowledge. And yet Paul prays that you might somehow know something that's beyond the ability to know. And maybe you've experienced that. I hope that we all have. Of what it feels like to know something that's even beyond our way of understanding. But the verse that I really am headed toward is the end of verse 19, after the so that. All of this comes together so that, please catch this, you may be filled with all the fullness of God. The goal is that so you might be filled with all of God. Okay, I don't think you're listening. Um, that you might... <laughs> 
that all of God may be in you. Is that just another rocket launch? It's like, oh, it's a rocket. That, is that something interesting? <laughs> Does that captivate anyone's imagination? There's a man named uh, Jacques Ellul that I, uh, I learned about a few years ago and have read some of his stuff. He was a French sociologist, uh, politician, theologian. Uh, he's sort of like me. Can't decide what he's going to be. He does a lot of different things. In 1954, he wrote a book titled The Technological Society. 1954. Keep that in mind. Before anything we might have thought of as technology. He, uh, in French, prefers the word technique. Technology is the study of, and we use it wrong, and so, but anyway, whatever. He, uh, he writes about technology. And really, in his mind, it's efficiency. It's what we think of, oh, let's use something to make things better for us, and easier, and faster, and whatever. And he predicted in 1954 that technology, technique as he would say it, is going to be presented to the world as the servant of humanity. And yet, technology would become the Lord of humanity. Well, he was wrong, obviously, so uh, I don't know why we talk. <laughs> Are you kidding? I was driving down the road in the mid-1990s, listening to something like NPR, I don't know, it was a news report, and it was talking about the beginning of personal computers and how computers were going to revolutionize the world. And it said, it said, as serious as it could be, it said, by the year, I don't know what it was, but it's past now, by the year, whatever, the typical work week in the United States of America would be 30 hours. And it made perfect sense, doesn't it? Because what did technology offer? The ability to do your job more quickly. You could, before long, you would be able to get everything done in a shorter amount of time. We're going to have more free time. Life's going to be better for us is what they predicted. And how did that work out for you? I, this is not meant to be funny. This is meant to be sad. I am nervous to go on vacation. Because life gets worse. And because the whole time I'm on vacation, I realize that either I need to be checking all of my work or it's piling up so much that when I get back, I'm going to be miserable. So I come back from vacation miserable. And yet the next whatever comes out that's more efficient, and I'm like, I want that too. In the foreword to the English translation of Ellul's book, Robert Merton writes, his thesis is, is that the problem is that is, it's all about continually improved means to carelessly examined ends. Continually improved means to carelessly examined ends. And what I'm proposing to you from this text in Ephesians is that what the end that God offers us is to be filled with all the fullness of God. And it's not an end so cheap as how many likes can I get on something? How many friends or followers can I accumulate? What is the neatest thing that I can have that someone else doesn't have? How can my car cook me breakfast or whatever it is that's, that's coming next? That what's offered is an alternative to this world's ends. And that in the spirit of God, we are offered the opportunity to have God inhabit us in his great work. Mike mentioned that I uh, went to law school. I went to law school later in life and uh, uh, ended up becoming one of the administrators there. Uh, at one point, I had uh, the opportunity to begin an institute that was there called the Paris Institute for Professional Formation. Uh, and I was given the opportunity through, uh, through a gift from the, the Paris family to hire somebody. And it just worked out beautifully for me uh, because there was a man named Danny DeWalt who was interested in coming to work at Pepperdine. And I had a chance to hire Danny. Uh, you may know, some of you may know the name Bob Goff. I don't know if anyone knows. Quite a few of you know Bob Goff. Well, Bob Goff and Danny DeWalt were law partners for 20 years. Goff and DeWalt, that was their firm. They were at a point in their life when they decided it's time to stop the law firm and just keep saving the world and doing the things that they're doing. Danny wanted to be at Pepperdine. And so I had a chance to hire him. And, uh, and one of the things I did was to welcome students when they were brand new to law school and invite them uh, to, uh, you know, into this, this interesting world. And so I turned that over to Danny during our new student orientation. 
And he gets up every year, and if you choose to go to Pepperdine Law School, I'm totally blowing his cover here, but he would ask, he would say, what's the most important thing in law school? And the answers would be, uh, you have to work hard. Uh, you, you would... Uh, you know, you need to uh, get up early. You have to, you know, learn how to write. I mean, there were all these answers and they'd all be wrong. Every answer would be wrong, he would tell them. And he'd practice for 20 years very successfully. And he finally would say the most important thing in law school is relationships. The most important thing you'll do is to develop relationships with your professors, with each other. And he said in the practice of law, the most important thing you may not have realized was about relationships of relationships with your client, with your colleagues, with the people that work in your office, with the other side, with the counsel on the other side. He said, that's where the magic happens. And it, and, it, and it strikes me, as we're talking about the Trinity and specifically the Spirit this week, that God is relationship. That God, by the very nature, is relationship. And that what I hear in this prayer is God offering to be in that intimate relationship with you and with me. And that what's taking place here in our inner core is in very fact a relationship both individually and communally with God. That God is breaking down every barrier, even the barrier between the outside world and our minds, even the barrier between our external body and our heart and our soul. And God is bringing all of this together as one. About eight years ago, I started running again and call myself a runner. Uh, now, um, I've had the opportunity to be a chaplain for the Pepperdine Cross Country team for the last few years because of that, which has been fun. Uh, and then a couple of days ago, 12 of us ran on Zuma Beach with, uh, with Mike. Mike won't remember this probably, but it, last September, he was running on Zuma Beach. And I know this because of social media. And Mike uh, got back and, uh, and typed out. And he said, while I was running today, I don't know if you remember it or not. He said, the song, for some reason, the phrase was in my head, echoes of mercy, whispers of love. He said, for some reason, that, that was in my head today. And he said... He said, you know, in my spiritual life, that's the way things have happened. Echoes and whispers. You said it, it wasn't foghorns or amplifiers in your mind. It was echoes and whispers. I think that's what Paul is saying. I pray that you may be filled with power in your inner being, that Christ may be found in your hearts. The person that wrote that song, we actually sang it earlier, many of you know, not personally, was Fanny Crosby. Fanny wrote thousands and thousands of songs, and you probably remember her story that Fanny was born blind. And Fanny wrote, uh, was a was pro, um, prolific writer of hymns and poems. She also memorized books of the Bible, including the Torah, when she was a teenager. She was phenomenally in love with God and with Jesus. And once later in her life, a preacher said to her, how sad it is that you were born blind. And she said to that preacher, she said, if I could go back to the day I was born, to the day I was born and have one wish only, I would wish that I would be blind. Because that way, the first face I will ever see is Jesus. And so when she wrote that classic song that we sing, Blessed Assurance, Jesus is mine. Oh, what a foretaste of glory divine. Heir of salvation, purchased of God, born of his spirit, lost in his love. But Mike remembered verse two. And picture Fanny saying, perfect submission, perfect delight. Visions, you get that? Visions of rapture now burst on my sight. Angels descending, bring from above. What do they bring? Echoes of mercy, whispers of love. May God bring his project of making all things one in him together. May he use us and transform us 
into the image of Christ, by having a relationship that we experience that's beyond words, there's a nearness and an intimacy that we will experience with God in our inner beings as he whispers and moves within each of us to do things more than we could ever imagine. Our text today is a prayer, so I'd like to close by praying it. And then afterwards, we will sing another song. Will you bow with me as I pray this prayer? I bow my knees before the Father, from whom every family in heaven and on earth takes its name. I pray that according to the riches of his glory, he may grant that you may be strengthened in your inner being with power through his spirit, and that Christ may dwell in your hearts through faith as you are rooted and grounded in love. I pray that you may have the power to comprehend with all the saints what is the breadth and length and height and depth and to know the love of Christ that surpasses knowledge so that you may be filled with all the fullness of God. Now to him who by the power at work within us is able to accomplish abundantly far more than all we can ask or imagine, to him be glory in the church and in Christ Jesus to all generations forever and ever. Amen.